he didn't know Nellie well. Hell, he barely remembered who she was until Eli's girlfriend Melissa pulled up her account on Instagram and had held it up for him to see. It was hard to concentrate on the phone screen in the loud, crowded bar, but he took it anyway, trying not to look too distracted. Gave it a cursory glance and then handed it back. Yeah, she's cute, he shrugged, his attention drifting back to the television screen hanging over the bar top. Come on, dude, Eli whined, reaching across the table to sock him in the arm. I want to do, like, couple stuff together. Give her a chance. She's fine. Gorgeous. Spectacular. He waved his friends off, not even tuning back in when Nellie, the woman of the hour, arrived, followed by their other friend, Henry. Nellie seemed to know the drill, sitting down next to him and shrugging her coat off her slight shoulders. What you watching? She asked, sliding up closer to him as the other three launched into some other conversation. Comet stuff? <sighs> Comet stuff, he thought to himself. The biggest extraterrestrial anomaly of our lives is just comet stuff. Don't mind Grant, Melissa piped in from across the table. He's just waiting for the end of the world. You know what I heard? Nellie continued, scooting closer still, even though they were on separate seats around this square high top. That Vesta 9 is passing close enough that it's already messing up our satellites. They're onboard clocks. Isn't that wild? Like the flip of a switch, his fixation on the TV ceased, and he turned to look at her in an entirely new light. Yeah, actually, I did. She shivers visibly, despite the pressing heat of all the people moving around them. It's hard to wrap your mind around, huh? The relative velocity is speeding time up, I guess. I mean, isn't that just what getting older is like? Henry interjects the conversation slowly turning to the Comet Vista 9 and its incredibly close pass of the planet. When we're young, everything seems to go so slowly. I guess because we're experiencing everything for the first time. But now as adults, it's like an entire month passes before we even realize it. So how could this comet make time go faster than it already is for us? He sighed. <sighs> it already sucks. But it's not going to hit us, right? Eli asked. Missing the point entirely? No. Grant shakes his head. The danger isn't in a collision. It's in how Vista 9 is going to affect the perception of things. It's real nuanced, but freaky stuff. Yeah, I try not to dwell on it too much. Nellie tells him quietly, bringing the topic back between the two of them, while the other three trail off once more. I'm afraid that if I focus on it, try to count the passing of the minutes, that... It's all going to become too real. There's so much life that I don't want to miss out on. Grant tips his beer back into his mouth, regarding Nellie as if she's some totally unique thing, a kindred soul. Her brown eyes, rich like dark ember, shine with the sincerity of her words. She's afraid, but like him, a little excited by the novelty of it all. Anything to break up the monotony. This woman her hair curling over her shoulders, one strand stuck to her sweat shimmery forehead, her expression lively with the talk of the comet time anomaly. Well, she could certainly break said monotony, obliterate it even. They peel away from Eli, Melissa, and Henry, going to the bar and ordering drinks there, leaning and talking as if they were the only two in the room. Grant would never admit that Melissa had managed to find him the perfect girl, but she had to be aware of her friend's geeky tendencies and the way they would mesh so well with his. Everyone on Earth was watching Vista 9 approach, but only some of them, like he and Nellie, were looking at it with a sense of rapt interest, a puzzle to be solved, a roller coaster to be ridden. It might best them or even ruin them, but it was all in the knowing. He took her home, pressing against her in the back seat of the cab, thigh to thigh. But it wasn't carnal just yet. It was still a boozy, touchy-feely meeting of the minds. It turned carnal, though. Because of course it did. What we're seeing with Vista 9, the man on the radio said, voice crackling with static, is unlike anything we've ever seen before. It brought this 
this sort of time dilation with it from wherever it was formed in the galaxy. Grant ran his hand up Nellie's thigh, and his lips brushed her neck. It's gravitational pull. It's orbital resonance. Yeah, Grant thought. It is. They barely noticed when the driver switched the station, soft blues music taking over, but they noticed when he spoke. Hey, have you guys felt the flyby yet? Grant paused, pulling away from Nellie, his ring catching on her hair as he shook his hand away. The what? They say it's different for everyone, he continued. I know this guy uh, down at the shop that I used to work at. Has a real bad. Swears that the past six months never happened. Wild stuff, right? Just live life while you can, they're saying. Blink and you might miss it, Grant added. But he wasn't talking to the cab driver anymore. He wasn't sure whether it was the racing of his heart or the flyby. But when he kissed Nelly, time surely seemed to speed up. He could still feel her in his bed when he woke up the next morning, the weight of her dipping the mattress and the soft sound of her breathing comforting, reassuring, familiar. Grant rolled over and reached out for the woman he had spent the previous evening with, skirting his fingers under the hem of her shirt to feel her skin. It was soft, warm, taut and rounded. Sleep well, he rasped, stretching out beside her. Are you kidding? She huffed, half amused, half frustrated. He can't seem to read her without seeing her face, but she surely must be joking around with him. So he smiles, moving closer until he can feel her hair on his mouth when he speaks. <laughs> I guess I didn't give you much of a chance, did I? You? <laughs> Don't flatter yourself. Then she shifts, and under his hand is something strange. Her belly. Pressing against his fingers is different. In fact, it's... He rips the blanket off her body, the nebulous form of the woman next to him becoming clear without the covering. Heavily pregnant and now angry. <laughs> Asshole! Nellie snaps, sitting up. Can't even let me get five more minutes, I guess. His eyes are locked on the all-too-unfamiliar side of her. How did this happen? How could she be... You're pregnant! He blurts out, head spinning. Yeah, great catch, she grumbles, standing with an exhausted groan, hand pressing against the small of her own back for balance and to relieve the tightness there. But of course she's pregnant. Nellie has been carrying his child for something like nine months now, by the look of her. Surely he knows this, somewhere in the back of his mind where the memories of it are hiding. They're so excited for the baby, at least he thinks so. Well, since you're now guilty of being an asshole, as usual, can you at least make me breakfast? Nellie asks, a note of teasing in her voice. He's still thrown, her waddle as she heads up to the bathroom nearly making him cry. Where is the memory of the positive test? The ultrasound? The marriage? Grant has to shake it off, physically stretching and rolling his neck, trying to come back into his body and mind fully. Yeah, sure. He answers, probably too quietly for her to hear. Breakfast. On his feet, at least the house is familiar enough. So is the bathroom, albeit scattered with Nellie's things. He cranks on the tap, going to splash cold water on his face with unsteady hands, and pauses. His reflection staring back at him is grayer than he remembers. Singular strands meeting together to form visible lines in his dark hair. Is that odd? It doesn't feel odd. He's getting older after all. Grant! Nellie yells from the bottom floor, and with a stab of panic about his pregnant wife, he leaves all thoughts of his vanity behind, flying past pictures of the day he was wed, his wife silhouetted by the Bahamian sunset, and one of him and his mother, her looking more stooped than he remembered. No time for that, though. Nellie needed him. She's in the kitchen holding a hairpin in her mouth as she switches the baby to the other hip. Caroline coos, pulling at her mother's collar. Her hair, blonde like Nellie's mom, is tied in a white ribbon. Grant stutters to a stop, and the world tilts beneath his feet. Am I... too late? He asks, 
mind still months behind, back on the day she went into labor in the way she had screamed. Nellie, obviously not pregnant, but very flustered, hands the squirming nine-month-old to him before taking the pin out of her mouth and sticking it in her hair, the final piece to complete her work ensemble. Yeah, you're late. I'm gonna miss my morning meeting. Sorry, he mumbles, transfixed by the little girl in his arms, the weight of her, the chubbiness of her cheeks. Whatever. Don't forget you're picking up my mother this evening, Nellie calls, heading out the door and shutting it behind her. Your... your mother? He parrots. In the background, the television drones on about the erratic orbit of Vista 9. Caroline blinks at him. Nellie is, of course, gone by this point and unable to answer his question, but he feels like he's so far behind at this point that it doesn't even matter. Grant can still hear the resident scientific expert on the morning news, and something that he says catches his attention. Its proximity to Earth has gone on much longer than expected. Everything that we've predicted, everything that the government has told us has been wrong so far. This isn't just an outer space anomaly anymore. It's a public health crisis and needs to be treated as such. We have what equates to nearly an entire lost generation out there. Mine's weak, mine's slipping. Where's Caroline? His wife asks, but Grant can't take his eyes from the screen. Are you hearing this? He asks, reaching out in a desperate hope for that kindred spirit that had commiserated with him about Vista 9 at the bar. When was it? Decades ago, surely? Although to Grant, it felt just like yesterday. But comets were the last thing from Nellie's mind. Grant, where is Caroline? Who? He asked, the name so familiar but dripping out of his brain like honey off a spoon. Your daughter, Grant, she snaps, frustrated at his incompetence. It wasn't like he wanted to be so dense. It just all felt so alien. At her words, he remembers the heavy baby and the powdery scent of her hair, but his arms are empty. When had he sat her down? I, I just had her, he says, turning to Nellie. She looks different, somehow. Haircut severe and practical and face lined ever so gently by the passing of time. She frowns, violet lipstick creasing on her mouth. What do you mean you had her? She lowers her head to her hands. I can't do this anymore, Grant. I just can't. He takes a step towards her, and it's difficult, like his muscles and bones are on just the slightest delay. Hey, I'm sorry. Nellie holds up her hand, telling him to stop in a single motion. He does so, conflicted, worried about Caroline and wondering how his wife had gotten home from work already. Grant is unsure where he should place his current concern. Do you know what I found in her purse? Here, let me show you. She slides a black vinyl bag down the kitchen counter, decorated with buttons and pins, the same way he had done to his jacket when he was a teenager. Nellie shoves her hand inside, rooting around until finally she slaps something on the table in front of them. He'd never seen anything like it. Shaped like a chunk of quartz, the thing glittered and glowed seeming to phase in and out of reality. Grant can't comprehend what he's looking at, both terrified to touch it and so curious that he wished he could. This is what she's become, Nellie tells him quietly, tears evident in her voice. This is what is left of our little girl. He barely hears her, reaching out as if powerless against the thing, desperate to feel it in his hands. There's something about it that speaks of different worlds, and escape for whoever claims the thing. She leaves for hours at a time, his wife continues, lying there, eyes empty, floating through whatever space and time this damn thing takes her to, before coming back and acting like nothing is wrong, like she isn't addicted to it. What is it? She scoffs. <laughs> Fine. Play dumb. I may have found that cute once, Grant. Once. She pushes past him in a huff, and he turns to watch her go, picking up the crystalline chunk once she's around the corner. It buzzes in his hand like a bee, alive but not really. He's torn, but eventually pockets the object and goes to follow Nellie up the stairs, 
calling her name as he goes. Once he's alone, it's like the weight of not knowing, of time barreling past him, like a runaway train. It's too much. At least when Nellie is there, angry or not, he isn't alone in this. The stairs are harder than he remembers. Either they're steeper or he's become out of shape because each one feels like an effort, but he makes it to the top. Nellie is just then shutting herself in their bedroom, and even though he asks her to stop, she doesn't, slamming the door in his face so hard that the mirror hanging on it shudders. That damned mirror, though. The person in it is such a stranger that he's taken aback at first, looking behind him to see who else it could possibly be. The stranger mirrors his actions. He's an old man, who looks suspiciously like his father, but when he leans in to get a closer look, his stomach seizes. It's him, his own face, weathered and worn. Grant touches the lines at the corner of his mouth, the patch of his receding hairline, and the heaviness of his cheeks, all with quivering fingers. His pupils are pinpoints, panicked and frightened. While he was trying to figure out where his life had passed him by, trying to dig through his brain to find the memories, even just a sliver of them, to make it all seem real, he grew old and stooped. His vision, blurry. His back aches. And still he's alone. I... I don't understand, he rasps. The crystalline thing in his pocket starts to vibrate again growing so warm that it almost burns. He tugs it out, dropping it when he becomes too warm to hold. Going from nebulous to round, it bounces away from him like a ball from an old quarter machine. Rolling across the carpet and down the stairs, it leaves phantom images in the air as it goes. Holograms that float independently. A clock, a calendar, and one thing that was always consistent. Advertisements. He bats them away like flies, and they disappear, formless under his touch. Nelly, he calls, broken and confused. Nelly, Hey, hey, she says from behind him just in time. Small hands rest on his shoulders, and Grant nearly sobs. Not alone. Nelly, he says for the last time, but the woman who is now stepping to the side of him shakes her head. No, Dad, it's me, Caroline. She's beautiful, like her mother, but her hair is lighter and fluffier, makeup heavy and brash. Under it, though, her expression is soft and gentle as her hands squeeze his shoulders in a comforting touch. But, but she was right here, he insists, head whipping from side to side. Caroline is well and good, but he needs Nellie. Dad... Caroline sighs sadly. She's gone, remember? No. Of all the things he missed, all the things he's been too late for, this can't be one of them. Devastation looms. N no, no, can't, no, can't be. Come on, Dad. Caroline tells him gently, leading him down the stairs. She pauses long enough to pick up the glowing thing, shutting off all the things still hovering in the air around them. He tries to protest, to ask more about Nellie, but every stair step takes his full concentration. He's winded by the time they reach the bottom, and still hasn't been able to discover the truth of where his wife had gone. His daughter, on the other hand, is right there, leading him to the sofa and helping him keep his balance as he sits. Grant groans, his elderly frame not wanting to bend. But after a moment, he makes it down on the seat, looking back up at Caroline with watery eyes. She was right here, Caroline. The woman bends down and kisses her father on the temple, pulling out the crystal thing turned orb and running her fingers over it as if she was scrolling on a phone. I know, Dad. In a way, she still is, right? He's silent, watching the holograms appear in front of his eyes as Caroline scrolls across the orb. Finally, she lands on something simply called Photos, tapping it and enlarging the image until it's all Grant can see. A slideshow starts, 
beginning with a picture of him the way he had felt not so long ago, young and spry and happy. To Grant, that person was so close, so familiar to him, that he felt almost a stranger sitting there old and decrepit in his body. His mind was still in his late twenties. He could still feel the way his legs would carry him up trails and through mountains. Now what was he? Who was he? The slideshow kept going, a slow, unavoidable retelling of his life that had passed him by. Yet there he was in the photos, living it, kissing Nellie in a white dress, holding a red-faced, angry newborn Caroline. Their first Christmas. A cat whose name he had forgotten. He was there for all of it. At least, his body was. Some part of him had lived and loved, but it seemed lost to him now. I'm gonna go, Dad, Caroline says after a few minutes. Be good, okay? He doesn't respond, not knowing how. The person he has become is so unfamiliar, he isn't even sure what he would say. There, in one of the pictures floating life-size in front of his face, is a shot of the thing that had started all of this for Grant. Vesta 9. It had brought some time-bending time distortion from deep in the cosmos, gotten caught in Earth's orbit, and took everything. Now, Grant was dying, and Vesta 9 was still out there, careening through space, having eaten every bit of his soul along the way. He's weeping silent, bitter tears. They catch in the wrinkles on his own skin. Vesta 9, in the photo, pulses, and as if on autopilot, Grant reaches out to touch it. Instead of feeling something against his fingers, a new window opens, displaying a live news feed. As many of you have heard, Vesta 9 has finally left Earth's orbit, and experts are positive it's not coming back, the anchor says, adjusting his glasses. Now, for those of you at home that have experienced the adverse effects of the flyby time, things will finally be getting back to normal. Just in time, I think, for so many of us. Well, that's your news at 7. Have a good evening, folks. The window closes, the room goes dark, and Grant is alone once more, feeble and empty of all the years of life he had walked through, unaware. Time slows, falling back into the pattern it had occupied eons before Vesta 9. Then, time marches on, eternal.